So I'm, I'm preaching on spanking tonight. Spanking. And I, I know I preached on it maybe six or seven months ago. I just thought I'd preach on it again, just because a lot of you guys have uh, very young children. And I feel like the, you know, sermons like this, they're, they're very applicable when your, your children come to that age, you start wondering about these things. And people ask me the same questions again and again. So I just thought I would preach on this again, just to give you some, uh, and additional things that I've learned, also give you some different scenarios as well. Because I feel like the topic of spanking, especially those of us who are in the room right now, we know it's biblical to spank our children, right? There's, there's no question about that. And, and we're gonna look at some of those verses soon. But when it, comes to, when it comes to spanking, really the questions that people have are the how and the why. Like, you know, how old to start spanking? How do you spank? You know, because you know, people want to know the reality of the spanking. Because it's really, even though people talk about spanking and they teach about spanking, you never really see other people spank their children. Right? It's always just theoretical. And, and unless somebody preaches something or teaches on how they actually go about it, you never really get in any insight into how what happens behind closed doors in the house. So that's really what I want to try and focus on today is not really so much the doctrinal side of spanking, but more the practical side. And hopefully, you know, even though maybe uh, maybe only six months, seven months has passed, now your children are a bit older. You know, it may be a lot more applicable to you, and and you'll you'll absorb in a bit more if you haven't absorbed in things the last few times I've preached on this topic. So the title of the sermon is Biblical Advice for Spanking Children. Because even as I, when I think about disciplining my children and spanking my children, it's not, to, to me, it's not just something that I've come up with or that some advice that somebody's given me. Yes, there's a lot of that too, because sometimes it's just wisdom that comes along, but we can get a lot of instruction from God's word itself. You know, like when people ask, well, how, when do you start spanking and things like that? I mean, the Bible gives us some guidance there. What to use when we spank? The Bible gives us some advice there as well. So we should always start with what the Bible teaches us and then we can see, oh, why does God have it this way? And then we can apply wisdom in our different scenarios to it. So we're going to look at that today. Biblical advice for spanking. So in Proverbs 23, this is where we see, apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Now, there are a lot of Christians out there that don't heed the instruction and the words of knowledge in the Bible because they try and raise their children without spanking, right? Even though the Bible tells us, hey, you know, there is, there's, there's correction that the child's need. And even when we read here, it says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Right? We're not going to kill our children by, by disciplining them, by spanking them. Look at this. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, I know those words in our modern day vernacular sound more like abuse, but really that's what's happening. When you smack somebody with a rod, when you smack somebody with a, with a stick or with, a, with a, any sort of utensil, I use a shoehorn, um, you know, that's what you're doing. You're beating somebody with a rod. So we don't want to buy into the philosophies of the world. That's what we have to really be careful of, especially with parenting. Parenting is an area that, same with dating, same with marriage, things that affect everybody. You know, when it comes to the family, dating, marriage, raising your children, birth is another one, you know, and, and raising our children. We need to be really careful that we don't buy into the philosophies of the world because there are all sorts of opinions out there. We need to make sure we reset and we renew our minds. We get back to the Bible and realize, hey, God has given us some instruction. Let's not get brainwashed or deceived into thinking something else. Because sometimes that happens amongst Christians, not amongst people in this church. I'm just talking about Christians in general. I'm sure you know Christians that, that think that there's a better way to raise their children and they don't need to spank and they're doing the timeouts, doing all this other stuff, rather than just following the way God has instructed us and how, how people have been doing it for even thousands of years. So Proverbs 23, Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. So it's interesting that thou shalt beat is like, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. The Bible's saying here, thou shalt beat him with the rod. We're actually commanded 
to beat our children with the rod to because every child needs it you know like some people think oh you know my child is really good it doesn't need to get spanked no no every child needs spanked because every child has foolishness every child is naughty right your children may be less naughty than another child but they're still correct they're not perfect right they're still naughty they still need to be instructed and corrected i i see parenting without spanking it's a bit like uh working mums you know you're not really parenting properly if you're not spanking your children because your parenting is missing something that is commanded of god uh, to do um, so there's this perception versus reality you know it's like, it's like people say well i'm going to parent without spanking it's kind of like working moms because when, when a mom is working in reality she's not always at home parenting right when, when you see people that think oh you know because because a lot of ladies think that they can do this they, they work and obviously there are people that are in situations that are not ideal but sometimes a woman thinks well i'm going to parent and raise my children but i'm going to be working as well and then the perception is oh these women are just wonder women right they can just they can just do every they seem to be everywhere and still be able to parent their child be successful in the corporate world but the reality of it is these women are actually struggling to parent their child or they've got help like they're either their grand their, their parents are helping them raise their children or they've got hired help or they're dropping their kid off at the daycare so what i'm saying is parenting without spanking it's a bit like working moms where they're, they're not actually parenting their child yes they're doing well in their career but somebody else is raising the child um, and it and the perception that it's possible is different to the actual reality because and, and even i talk to a lot of these women at the, the place i work with and you can see that you know they're struggling to manage raising their children with with actually pursuing a career i remember talking to one of the more successful managers at my work and um, she was telling me oh she just had you know a couple of children they're really young they're in primary school and i said to her i asked her I said, how do you, how do you like dedicate so much time at work and excel? Because she was one of the, one of the top like heads of one of the departments at work. I just said to her, surely, uh, you know, you must be struggling to, to raise your children and, and, you know, to, to be able to excel to the position you are. And she said to me, yeah, yeah. she said, because my parents help out a lot. So she said, you know, and she has to spend a lot of money on daycare. You know, her parents are always over. And she was saying like, yeah, if her parents didn't come over from another country to help her take care of her children. Yeah, she would have had to take time off work. And so my point is, you know, pe people think that, hey, that they can work and excel. But the reality of it is that, you know, most moms that are working are dropping the ball somewhere at home. Because it take, it's a full-time job. I and mean, you ask Elizabeth to, to raise children, even, you know, obviously we have five children, but even, you know, having two children, one child is a full-time job right so something is something something will will, will be uh will fall through the cracks there so another thing another thought about parenting without spanking it's funny when you listen online on youtube or you know on the internet where you have moms that don't spank and they, you know how they have these sort of discussion groups online and they're having these interviews and they're talking about their problems that they face and, and all this sort of stuff. And they're talking about how they, how they raise their children and how they deal with problems without spanking. And what I always find funny about those discussions is things like tantrums in the shopping center, you know, meltdowns and, and children melt, like, you know, my child, you know, what, what, they'll be asking things like, oh, what do you do when your child just loses it and they're just hitting you and things like that? And you just think, well, you know, amongst parents that spank their children and they have high standards and they discipline their children, this, this doesn't occur. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't talk to my wife and think about, well, when was the last time, you know, Simon had a meltdown in the store and, and he was pulling things off the shelf and it's like, how, do you, how did you deal with that? And the other moms are saying like, don't worry, you're doing a great job. It'll pass. You just have to just deal with it. So that's what I mean by parenting without spanking. They're not actually doing anything about it. They're not actually parenting their child and spanking them. They're just letting them go through these meltdowns and, and these things where they just assume these just happen. But these things don't just happen. You know, I don't have my child behaving like that in the shops because we nip it in the bud at home, right? You nip it in the bud, you have high standards at home and you spank, right? Because it's an effective punishment that changes and alters behavior. 
So all that to say this, you know, don't buy into the world's deception of child rearing. You know, they talk about parenting and having no need to spank. And then you listen to their alternatives. You listen to their examples and you listen to their discussions. And it's a joke, right? It's an absolute joke. And then, then you read the comments underneath. And there's all these moms like just pulling their hair out saying like, I can't do it. Like, is it that's because that's not how it's meant to be done. Right? If they did it the right way, then they would be able to cope. You know, that's why people wonder. You know, well, I tell people at work I have five children and they, you can see their eyes light up, their jaw drops. You know, they're just like, how do you do this? I had like one child and I couldn't even handle it. What's well, because they're assuming that my five children is like their one child, right? But if your five children are not like their one child, then it, it's not as bad. Yeah, it's, are children hard work? They're always going to be hard work. Right? Are they going to play up? Yes, they're always going to play up. But there's a big difference between having one really bad child that just makes your life hell everywhere you go and at home and having five children where you've limited the misbehavior and you can keep them in line and they behave, they're actually more of a blessing. They're nice to have around. You know, it's like people with my kids, they're always complimenting my kids and they're happy and they, they like having them around, right? Because they're, they're not always just being bratty. So don't buy into the world's deception because the reality of it is, it, it, you know, what people perceive are these perfect parents on YouTube, parenting without spanking and the way God has ordained it. In reality, I bet if you actually met their children, as I, sometimes I always wonder, like people say, oh, you know, I raised my children this way with timeouts, whatever. And sometimes they just want to meet their children and just really see whether their ch the child that they present on YouTube is re the reality of the child if you actually need the child. But yeah. Anyway, let's go on to the next point. Otherwise, I'll never get through this sermon. So uh, Hebrews 12. Now, a lot of people think, oh, spanking's only mentioned in the Old Testament. No, spanking is in the New Testament as well. And Hebrews 12 really is the, the place where we learn about God actually using the analogy of us being his children and chastening us. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So just one point I want to stop at verse 6 is, a lot of people think, oh yeah, chastening is mentioned in the New Testament, but that's just talking about discipline. You know, you, there's other ways to discipline without spanking. You know, they start going through all their alternatives and there's not really that many alternatives. But the Bible is very clear that when in Hebrews 12, it's talking about chastening, it is talking about a beating. Why? Because it says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, look at this, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, what is a scourging? A scourging is a whipping, isn't it? It's actually getting hit by something. So the chastening here is not just a rebuke or discipline. Uh, it's actually a physical punishment. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So I'm just underlined father here because I want to show you here that fathers need to be involved in the discipline of their children as well. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So he's saying if you're a son of God, or you're supposedly a child of God without chastisement, then you're not actually a child of God. You're not a legitimate child of God. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall, not, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So one thought I want to give you there on verse 9 is it's showing here that fathers also should be responsible for the spanking. Now, for those of you who have children and they're starting to get of spankable age, if you haven't spanked your child yet, fathers, you guys are failing. You guys have to be in charge. You have to be, in, you have to be involved in the spanking too. And it works the other way around as well. If, there, if, there is a, if you're parenting children and only the father's doing the spanking, the mother is dropping the ball because both parents have to be involved in the discipline of the children. Somebody asked me that question on YouTube. They said, hey, what, do, 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 are you mainly in charge of the spanking or is it your wife's role or is it a shared role? And I said to them, it's a shared role. We both discipline our children. We have both spanked our children. Why? Because I don't want our children thinking they can get away with one parent and not with the other, right? 
So let's say, for example, if, if Elizabeth is the only one that spanks, and I'm like, oh, Liz, that's Elizabeth's response. She's the only one that spanks. Well, what happens when Elizabeth goes to the shops and the kids are bad? Do I have to wait for Elizabeth to come home before I spank the children? No, see, I have to be there. Then the children know they can play up, right? Because hopefully by the time mum gets home, dad's forgotten, right? To tell mum that they need to spank. And it works the exact opposite way around. You know, if you're a mum that's not willing to spank your children and you're always like, wait till your father gets home, chances are like you, you might forget by the time, you know, you, they, get, they get home. And, you know, you don't want your children to know that they can be bratty with you until dad gets home. You know, you need to rule your house as well as the mother when you're at home. So both need to spank. But I find the tendency is because women are normally always at home, you know, especially in our culture, women are sort of taking the lead in the family, fathers being more, you know, uh, taking a back seat. So I feel that in our culture in Australia, this is what needs to be preached. That fathers, you need to make sure you are involved in the discipline of your children as well. And don't just leave it to the mom, you know? And in fact, I feel as though in my situation, in my family, it's good. I'm sure Elizabeth appreciates when I spank the children because sometimes I'm a bit more level-headed, right? I'm a bit more, you know, I haven't been with the kids all day. So I think it kind of can reset as well to show, hey, hey, this is how you can spank the child without being too, you know, all up and, you know, because sometimes when you're at home with the kids, if you guys know, you know, it's, you get a bit stressed. You're not always in the right frame of mind. So that's, a, that's another reason why both of you need to spank, right? Because sometimes ch raising children is not all just a bed of roses, right? You guys know that. You know, when they're older, you'll know exactly what I mean, where sometimes you're not in the right frame of mind to spank that kid, meaning you're upset and if you spank them, you might not spank them the right way. So if both of you are able to spank your children, you can support one another in that area. You can know, hey, I'll, you know, I can spank them, or I'll spank them this time because I'll spank them with the right attitude and, and so forth and so forth, because we're not always perfect, right? So you need to, you don't want that burden to only be on one parent, because it's not pleasant. You know, it's like the Bible says here, right? You know, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. So it's not, it's not pleasant for the parent either. And, and I don't think it's right or fair that that, that responsibility, which should be on both parents, because you're there to support one another, that whole burden is just put on one person to deal with and to handle. Whereas if you can share that load, obviously it makes it a lot easier. But grievous, look, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, you may not see change in your child overnight, but let me tell you, if you are consistent and you continue to discipline your children and spank them, you will see a change in behavior. You know, people, even at my old church, right, people would see when Simon was a young boy, they would see, hey, Simon, when I said no, he paid attention, right? He would stop, he would, he would drop something if I said no. Or like I would say, hey, come here, he would come over, ask him, hey, Simon, can you throw this in the bin for me? You could throw it in the bin for me. You know, one two-year-old boy, right? But they, they see, you see the difference between a parent that disciplines their children, the child has some fear in, of the parent in him and a child that doesn't, right? You guys know as well, you see the difference. When, you know, if, if a child's running off, right, and a parent says, stop, turn, you know whether there's discipline going on in the house because if there's discipline and there's a bit of fear in the child, the child will perk up. But if the child has no fear of his parents and he just keeps running, he doesn't care what his parents say. Don't touch that. No, you just, you know, it's sometimes with some parents, you know, if you say don't touch something, it's like the more the kid touches it. You know, it's they know, they get it. The kids do that, right? Kids do that too. I just thank it out of them, right? That's why I remember, like I said, my old church people would be commenting, saying, oh, you know, hey, Simon's a really good boy. Like, and I remember talking to one parent and somebody said to me, oh man, your, your children, they're just, they're just so well-natured. And I was saying to them, it's, it's no accident. They're not well out. I had to spank, I had to spank it out of them, right? It's because I spank them and I discipline them, I teach them. That's why they're like that. It's not, it's not an accident. I don't feel like it's, I, I honestly am surprised when people tell me my kids are well behaved because sometimes I feel like my kids are so misbehaved. You know, like I, I ask them to do things they don't, but sometimes I think I, I, we, we just have to reset our perspectives on it because when, when I compare them to other people's kids, I'm like, hey man, they're actually pretty well behaved. And maybe I'm just a bit hard on them. But when, when you're at home and you're thinking, oh, you know, I've asked you to do this, you haven't done it. And, and you know, I think, oh man, sometimes I, I think my children are not that well behaved, but 
um, people seem to, to think they are, so they, they must be. Uh, so you want to support one another. Um, you know, it's not pleasant for the parent. It's not pleasant for the child either, but, but if you do it consistently, you trust me, you will see a change in behavior. And it takes faith, guys, especially if you're a new parent. You know, I spank my children without question now, you know, when, because we've seen the changes in our older kids. But when we started, it took faith because you have people telling you, oh, you know, you spank them and you're just going to get them upset. They're just going to, you know, they're just going to be angry. You know, people tell you, oh, you hold your child too much and they're just going to be unsocial. You know, there's always people having their different opinions, right? And with discipline, even more so. People have their different opinions on how children should be raised and all that sort of stuff. And it takes faith to say, you know what? No, I'm going to spank my child with the rod, like the Bible says. And, you know, I, I've gone through it. So now I can tell you, hey, it does work. And you know, the Bible is true in this, in this aspect. And I've proved it myself. Um, so it's not pleasant for the parent or the child, but it, but it will result in a change of behavior if you, if you do it correctly. And that's sort of how we're, what we're going to talk about now. So one question I always get when people ask me about spanking, they always ask me, how old do you start spanking? Right? How old should your child be before you start spanking them? Because people think that there's only one way to spank a child. It's just, you know, you just default five spankings with a stick. Like, you know, so I'm just, they're just thinking like, oh, like a six month old, do I spank them like that? Like a one year old, do I spank them like that? No, no, no. So, let me give you some of the things I think, but let me show you what the Bible says first. But the Bible says here in Proverbs 13, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now I'm sure nobody wants to hate their children, but the Bible says here, if you spare the rod, meaning you withhold correction from the child, you're not only going to spoil the child, like the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil, uh, like people say, spare the rod, spoil the child. The Bible says here, if you spare your rod, you actually hate your child. You're actually hating them. So we don't want to hate our children. That's why we're commanded to beat them with the rod, to show them that love and that correction so that it will get that foolishness out of them. Look at this. But he that loveth him chasteneth him be time. So what does the word be times mean? It means earlier than normal. Right? We chasten them early. Now, early obviously is relative to different people. So this is where wisdom comes in. I can only share with you my experience, but... Uh, depends how you define a spanking, right? If we define any sort of hitting at all, I reckon it starts quite early on. You know, even I think even before one year old. One year old is where we really start spanking them over the knee and hitting them on the bum. But I remember once Anastasia was, uh, I don't know if you remember Anastasia, but you put this, this video on, on, on Facebook where the, the, they're trying to change the child on the bed I changed the child on the change room. The child's like turning over and kicking and crawling away. And I said to Anastasia, you just have to just give the child a few slaps on the thigh. They cry at first, but after all they learn that when they're on the change table, they need to sort of lie there and get their, get their, um, get their diaper changed. And you'll think like, you know, a nine month old, a 10 month old kid won't get it, but they get it. And it's, it's really funny, and this is why for first-time parents, it requires a lot of faith to spank your children, because the first time you spank your children, it's a bit heartbreaking, right? Because if you, if you, if for those of you who have spanked your children when they're quite young for the first time, you spank them, and there's that look on their face like they've just been so betrayed, like, what did you just do to me? <laughs> and those of you who have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? They look at you and they're just like, what? Like, did, did you just actually spank me? And, you know, then they cry, and, but it's like you didn't even really hit them that hard the first time. And it's like that on the change table. You know, you slap them on the leg and they cry a bit, but then they learn that, you know, when, they, when they're on the change table, they don't. So I find with my kids, I haven't really had that problem with kids, you know, not, you know, not staying lying down on the change table or wanting to turn over and crawl around because when they do, I put them back, you know, give them a little slap on the side, thigh, I'll put their legs back, I'll say no, you know, don't move your legs. And yeah, they're not perfect, but you know, even with Noah, I mean, with Noah, we've never really had her like, you know, crawling around. And she can't roll over yet, but I remember with Abel, you know, he wasn't just like crawling all over the table and Simon as well. So it starts quite small. 
uh, starts quite young, you know, just with small smacks when changing their diaper. You know, sometimes as well when they, they get a bit older, you know, when they start reaching for things they shouldn't, maybe they'll be crawling around, reaching for PowerPoints, you give them a bit of a slap on the, on the arm. Right, so maybe you just use a ruler or something, just like a light slap, and they kind of will, will look at you, right? And they're like thinking, is that why I got slapped? And they try again, and they get slapped, and then they, like, they don't want to touch that anymore. So that's just how it works at the beginning. And then as they get older, then, then you can just start bending them over your leg and spanking. And I think it happens at about one year old. You know, when they start walking, uh, you really start realizing their understanding, and then you start spanking them on the bump. Now let's go on to Proverbs uh, 22. So this is another thing that people disagree about. And I think the Bible is really clear on this, guys. Like people disagree about how to spank their children. And I think the Bible is really clear that we use an instrument to spank our children. We actually use something. We don't use our hand. The Bible says here, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So I know the Bible talks about scourging, but you can also be scourged by a rod, right? Like a whip doesn't necessarily need to be a loose whip, right? A whip can be a stick, right? Where you're scourged with a rod. So I would, I would not recommend at all. You know, the Bible doesn't teach us that we use our hand to spank. I don't think it's necessarily wrong. I just think it's not as effective. I think there's a reason why the Bible calls it the rod of correction. And I wouldn't use a belt either because a belt is floppy. You know, when something is floppy, it's not rigid you may hit wrongly, right? And, and definitely don't use the buckle side of the belt. I mean, you know, I know people joke about it sometimes. They say like, oh, you know, back in the day, my dad spanked me, like he beat us with the belt, he'd use the buckle side of the belt. Now, I think that is a bit, like, that's pretty harsh to get beat with a belt or the metal buckle. I mean, you've got to be hitting your kid pretty hard to, to, to just slap them. You know, you're probably just going to cause some damage and some internal damage there. So definitely don't use something that's floppy, you know, and that's why, you know, you may think, you may think it's more humane to use your hand to spank your child, but there's a reason why God calls it the rod of correction. It's a rod of correction because it's actually more humane to use an instrument to spank your child because you don't have to hit them as hard. It's more of a stinging pain than a blunt force trauma. Um, and when you use your hand, your hand is actually quite soft, right? And it's not, and it's not very rigid. Right? So you can actually do, um, do a lot more effective spanking with something that is hard. Now, what do I use? I know you guys know what I use, but I'll just go through my reasoning if you've never heard it before. Because we, we first started, so the reason why we use an instrument is because the Bible says there's a rod of correction. The reason why I use something rigid is because it's a rod of correction, right? It's not a whip of correction. So that's why it's something rigid. Now we started spanking with wooden instruments like this because everyone talks about the wooden spoon. So we're like, okay, we'll try a wooden spoon. So I bought a wooden spoon and it was good when, at the beginning when you do like a light slap, you know, either on the arm or on the leg or on the butt. But when your kids start getting older, that doesn't work anymore. You know, when your kids start getting like three years old, four years old, a slap with something this small yeah, yeah, they'll complain about it, but, but they, they can take it by that point, right? So you need something a bit bigger. So when we kept spanking with, um, with a wooden spoon, uh, we, we tried spatulas like this as well, because we thought, I thought, well, that's a bit more rounded, right? So this gives it a bit more surface area to slap on the butt. So, so well, well, what we found when we were using these things, they just broke way too easily. I think it's something about how the wood is. But for those of you who have spanked with wooden utensils, they just break so easily. So we're just going through so many of them. So thank God Ricky came along, right? Ricky came along. So Simon, if you're wondering where we got the idea of the, uh, of the shoehorn, you can, thank, you can thank Ricky over there. So Ricky comes to church one day with one of these and she says, hey, maybe this is actually a good spanking utensil. And we're like, what's that? Because I've never used a shoehorn in my life, right? And she's like, oh, it's a shoe one. You just buy them from Ikea. They're really cheap. And I'm just like, man, this is like the perfect spanking utensil because it's really long and you can, it's, got, it's like on a hook that you can hang it up on. And because it's long, you've got a bit more like slapping they can do. So this has been really good. That's why I recommend this to everybody. They're so cheap. They're plastic as well. So they, don't, they do break. I, I thought they were indestructible, but Elizabeth has broken some. I think cause she's not as accurate as me with the, with the things. Sometimes she's like hitting the wall and stuff. I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> she's like broke. So we just take the ones that are broken, that are small, and then we keep them in the car. So that would be like when you've got less room in the car. 
You can use the small. You can use the smaller ones. So I definitely think if you don't have one of these, get one of them. You know, they're only like three bucks from IKEA, and I definitely think like this. These are these are really good to spank. So I think wooden ones spank way too easy, and uh, you know, Ricky was actually the one that that gave us the idea to use a shoehorn. <coughs> Now, I just want to talk about the, having the right attitude before I get into a bit more of the practical side of spanking. But what's the right attitude we have? Because, you know, the, the, the world has it right in the sense that if you only discipline and there's no love in that relationship, that'll fail as well, right? So that's why we have to be beware. You, you know, spanking complements good parenting, right? It's part of good parenting. But spanking is not all good parenting is. Because some Christians grow up and they just think, well, I spanked my child, what went wrong? Well, if you never spoke to the child, you stuck him in Sunday school all the time, you sent him off to Christian school, and then when they got older, you sent him off to Bible college, and you never actually spent any time teaching and having a relationship with the child, spanking is not going to have any effect, right? Or if you have, you know, if you have the wrong attitude when you spank, right? So the Bible says here in Ephesians 6, again, uh, uh, an exhortation to fathers. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we also got to have love there when we discipline our children. There needs to be a relationship there. So, but if you have that relationship with your child, spanking will be a very effective way to correct them. Proverbs 22, it says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail so isn't it interesting that it links sowing iniquity right sinning to reaping vanity and that's the same as if we do it wrong in our parent wrong in our chastisement we're going to reap vanity it's not going to profit anything so that's why we want to make sure that our correction our rod of correction is profitable and we do it with the wrong attitude it's not going to be as effective as doing it with the right attitude so part of the way you can do it with the right attitude is I always tell people you, you need to um, one piece of advice I can give you is that you can you need to spank sooner rather than later what do I mean by that not just not we're not just talking about age now I'm talking about when you give the child a warning spank them earlier because sometimes people will give their child one, two, ten times, and now they're so frustrated. Now is a last resort. Now they're going to spank the child. And they're angry, they're flustered, they're upset, and they're not thinking about how they spank the child. right? But if you have higher expectations for your child, you just correct them once, you ask them to do something once. They don't do it, you spank them. Right? And if they do it again, then you spank them. You, just, you have consistency in how you spank. You spank them earlier. You're going to spank them with the right attitude. Why? Because you're not so frustrated when you spank them. So spank sooner with less warnings. There's so many benefits to that. One is you have the right attitude. One is you, you set the expectation for the child a lot higher. Right? Because if the child, if you spank them after you count to 10, why, you, know, you put that down, Johnny. One two three what do children do when you can even my children's the same if i give them like three minutes to finish their food sometimes sarah just like waits two and a half minutes and then she tries to like you know so they just like delay it as long as they can right you know so i, I try and be reasonable with them sometimes because i was like okay i'm gonna give you some time to finish your food but you know they they, 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 they we're still working on that right trying to get them to finish their food and not just sit there with their food in front of them so spank sooner with less warnings. You know, your children will learn what you expect. So if you expect them to obey the first, the second time, and then you spank them, they're going to learn that that's what's expected of them. Whereas if they know they're going to get away with counting to 10, they're going to they're learn that, they're going to expect that. Now, let's, let's talk about spanking position. Because this is something that's changed for me over the years, and different, different people have different opinions, but... Um, spanking position. I don't know, um, does anyone want to come up and uh, I can give a bit of a demo? Matea? Simon, do you want to come up and give a bit of a demo? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is why I've got this clown here, if you're wondering why this clown is sitting up here. I just thought I'd give you a bit of a demonstration of the position that I've come to that I think works well. But um, I know this clown is a bit, a bit creepy. A little bit of background about this clown. <laughs> this clown was given to me by one of my aunties. And I know this clown. Who's scared of clowns? Is anyone here scared of <laughs> Huh? 
<laughs> Anastasia's scared of clowns. So this clown, I, I just thought at the very beginning this clown was so creepy. But I, I've learned to love this clown because <laughs> this clown <laughs> was given to me by my auntie. And when we first used to drive the Corolla, the one that Lewis is driving now, this clown lived in the car. Because when we got it, after we left, I just said, oh, I'll just chuck it in the car and just at the back. And now it's become like our clown, our crazy clown in the car. So this, car, this clown has always been in the car. And I used to joke that, like, you know, it'd be sitting in the back seat and then the next day I'd get into the car, it'd be sitting in the front seat with me. It's like... <laughs> so, so that's why I'm, I'm starting to grow fondness of this clown because he's always, he's been with us for a long time. So anyways, I thought this clown would be a good, uh, good uh, doll to use to give you a bit of an illustration. So some, with spankers, this is what I found is the most effective because some people, they just bend their kid over their knee. Some people will put them on the bed and put their face into the bed, give them a spanking. What I found is, because what, what's hard is if you're home alone, right, how to hold your child in a way so that you can spank them so they're not flailing all over the place. Because when children get to a bigger age, when they're like five years old, six years old, you can start telling them, hey, well, if you don't stand still, I'm going to give you more spankings. So people that are Simon and Timothy's age, they're able to just take the spankings. Sarah sometimes can, sometimes can't. So sometimes you have to hold her down. Otherwise, she's not just going to comply and stand there and spank. Um, and children that are, you know, even Abel. Abel is at the age where he's going to fight that spanking, right? And he's going to flail. And, and, and so you have to restrain him somehow. Now, if they're younger than that, if they're one to two, uh, for, for parents you would know at that age, they don't really fight that much. You kind of, you might sit down, right? You bend them over the leg. And they, and they, they don't know that they can get out of this. So they, they, you just have them there, right? And it's funny when they're like one, two years old, they don't, they don't even kick or anything, right? And then you just spank them. And once they start learning that they can kick and get out of this, this is how, I, this is, this is how I've learned to keep them restrained. So if you're on, if you're on a couch or something, and that's why this, this hook is good, right? Because you can like hook it on a chair or hook it on the couch. So I, I bend them over this way so that their face is sort of in the couch and then I hold their arms back. So at this point, you know, they might, might kick their legs like this. And sometimes they'll do the doggy paddle. Sometimes kids will do like the, the bucking, right? They're like, oh, oh, oh. So you have to, so as a parent, you have to kind of learn a bit of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? You get the rear naked choke on them. <laughs> So what I, found, what I found works is you kind of like lift your legs because you know they, they're kicking like this, right? So you're going to kind of like get your legs over and like lock them in. And then you sort of like bend and then press your legs again. So they're, now they're like stuck there. And with my left arm, I'm like holding them back like this. So now they're stuck, right? And so I find that you have to like alternate because from this angle, you can only kind of get the right cheek. So sometimes you need to like even it up, like do it the other way, right? That way. And then you can get the left cheek. So... I found that that's the best position for me because I'm able to restrain the child with my legs and with my arm. And they, if you hold them that way, then their arms don't come back. Because what, because what children will do, they're, obviously they're trying to not get spanked, right? So their arms come back. So you've got to try and hold their arms forward and then lock it in like that. Also, some things they try and do to get out of the spanking, like they'll twist. They're trying to like twist out of this. But then if, if you sort of hold them down and lock them with your legs, it like minimizes how much they can twist. So that's how I hold them, right? And sometimes their face is like in a pillow or something so that they, can, they can't really scream that loud. And I spank them that way. Now, one thing you should keep in mind as well is when, when your children get spanked, don't, don't let that be an opportunity for them to just flail and just carry on, right? So after they're spanked, I don't let them go until they've stopped trying to resist, right? So I give them their spankings and sometimes they're still like, oh, I'm trying to get, and I just tell them, I just say, hey, stop, stop, you know, calm down. And then once they've calmed down, then I let them up, right? And then they'll be crying and I'll be like, okay, you know, get a tissue, you know, and then I'll tell them, you know, don't do that again or whatever they got their spanking for. So hopefully that helps. It gives you a picture of the sort of how it works in my house, right? So you just need to find somewhere to sit, you know, bend them over your leg, hold their legs down with one leg, and then that sort of frees up one hand to, to hit them with. Uh, if, if you're having trouble, because I know with, especially with kids that are bigger, you know, maybe uh, the mom is not strong enough to hold the kid down. So sometimes, you know, sometimes Elizabeth and I will tag team, right? Like if we can't, all, like sometimes if, I, if Elizabeth's like this and she's like struggling to get, you know, trying to get the legs over, I'll, j I'll just walk over and just like hold the legs, boom, and then like, they can't get it. Once there's two parents on them, that's it, right? <laughs> they ain't going nowhere. <laughs> right? So 
That gives you a bit of a, a picture. Hopefully you remember that when it, when you, when it gets to your... Now, another thing people ask me is this. People ask me, how do you deal with children? How do you spank children in public places? Now, this is just my opinion now, but I personally don't really spank children in public places. Like, I, I think it's, especially in our culture, it's quite dangerous, I think, to do it as well. You know, if somebody reports you or something like that, if they hear the child scream, because it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to hear a child scream. If, you, if you've come to my house and you've heard my children get a spanking, you know it doesn't sound pleasant. But then look at the result. Right? My, children, my children are great. So when it comes to public places, I would recommend you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't spank people in public places. I see it as, well, if you've done a good job at home or you had high standards at home, that's going to limit how they behave when they go over to somebody else's house or they go to a public place. Now, probably the closest I've done when I've gone out to a public place is if the car is not too far away, then I'll, I'll bring the child to the car, we'll spank them in the car and, and bring them back out. So the car's pretty good because it's quite soundproof as well and there's not really much where they can run around and whatnot. We usually keep a spanking stick in the car. Now, when your kids are older, now we found at like say Simon and Timothy's age, uh, especially with Simon, I could say when he does something out, I'll say, hey, well, I'm gonna give you a spanking for that when you get home. When they're younger, I don't think it's as effective because they're not really, they, you know, they probably don't even remember what they did out. But somebody who's Simon's age, <laughs> he's probably thinking, somebody who's Simon's age, he knows what he did out, he remembers. And I find at their age, they're starting to hope that when we get home, that I've forgotten. So if you say, hey, you're gonna get spanked when you get home, make sure when you get home, you actually spank them, carry through with it. You know, and I, I, I feel like it, that takes a lot of effort to do because it might have happened a long time ago. You get home, you're tired. You also feel like, ah, oh, you know, I don't wanna make a big deal out of it because, you know, it's so, you know, they've been good since then, you know? But, you know, you, you, need, you need your children to know that when you say something, you mean it, right? Because if, if you say out and about, oh, you're gonna get it when you get home, and then when they get home, they never get it, then it's not gonna mean anything when, when you're actually out and you say, you say to them, hey, you're gonna get a smack when we get home. So keep that in mind. You need to make sure you carry through with the things that you say. Uh, let's talk about how many spankings. Proverbs 19, 18. The Bible says here, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So the Bible doesn't tell us how many swats, right? But what I can tell you is this, that when a child gets a spanking, they ought to be crying. If you spank your child, and they're not crying, then you're not doing it right. Because some parents think that they're spanking their child, and when you ask them, well, how are you actually spanking your child? And they say, well, I just spank them with my hand, like this, on the outside of their clothes. And sometimes the child just carries on because they're just annoyed that you're doing it to them, but they're not actually feeling the pain of it. So this is why you have to, you have to understand that you, you will know with your child there's a difference between when they've actually been spanked properly and they're crying, and they're just carrying on and whining because they don't like getting in trouble. So you need to spank them properly. I always recommend, hey, make sure you pull down the diaper, pull down the short, pull, make sure you get to the bare skin, then you don't have to spank them as hard. It hurts a little bit more, there's a bit more stinging as well, and it'll be a lot more effective. So you just need to make sure that they're crying. So how many times do you spank them? That's where it takes a bit of wisdom, right, as a parent. It's, it's gotta be enough to hurt. Because if the spanking doesn't hurt, that's when it doesn't work. So make sure your spanking's hurt. And crying is a good indication, and especially the way they cry as well, that it hurts. Now what do I do? Uh, I usually do about three to five for the younger kids. But I find with, even at Simon's age, even with this, Simon gets to the age where he can take it. Like if I just give him three spankings with this, he knows it's gonna be over in a split second, right? So I've started to give him more now, sometimes up to 10 swats with this you know, to really make it a point because I know Simon understands things a lot better. So it just takes some wisdom on what you're going to do. But I will say this, consistency is always more effective than the amount of times you spank or how hard you spank. If you're just consistent with how you spank, what you spank for, you'll, you will see results in your child. Okay, let's go on to, this is the second last topic. So I've got two more things to cover. Another thing is, Make sure you spank and you teach at the same time. 
If you're going to discipline your children, always teach them at the same time what they're getting spanked for. You know, don't just be upset with a child, just spank them and leave them thinking, I don't even know why I got spanked, right? A child should always understand why they get spanked. I tell them beforehand, hey, this is what you're getting spanked for, and then they get spanked for it, so they know. So make sure when you spank them, give them an explanation of what they disobeyed. Even when it's really young, like a lot of people, like say like a one-year-old, even when Abel was like one or two, if he like, through, let's, uh, give me give you an example. Right? Let's say he threw his cup off the table, right? And I, I, I think that's unacceptable. You know, some people make excuses for their children and say, oh, you know, that's just how children are. Children don't need to, yeah, they are like that, but that's what we're trying to change. Children do chew on things and they throw things on the ground and they're messy, but you can change these things, right? So let's say your child is like always throwing their cup on the ground and they think it's funny and you're, you're saying, no, don't do that, Johnny, and he won't do it. Well, then I'll, you'll give them a spanking, right? So let's say you gave them a spanking. Now, if it was me, like let's say with just a, a really young child and he threw something on the floor. Now, before I go spank him, I'm just going to point to what he threw on the floor, right? You just show them over and you get them to look at the spill on the floor. You say, look, no. And then you go over and spank them, right? And I find that that gives them the connection between, you know, what they're getting spanked for. So don't think that children are stupid. You know, even like a one and a half year old, a two year old, they know what's going on. It was so weird when, especially now I notice it in my younger kids, like Abel, when he was like two years old, even though he doesn't say anything, he doesn't speak anything, he's still, still speaking like a baby, yet he understands what we're saying. Because I'll say to him, go pick up that helicopter, and he picks it up. You know, just things like that. So don't underestimate what children are understanding. And if you think, well, they're not talking, they don't understand anything, then you're, you're missing out on teaching them something that they could know. So if they, if they do something naughty and you point to them and you say, no, don't touch this or don't spill this on the ground, and then you give them a spanking, they'll make that connection. So make sure you're spanking and teaching. If they spill something, maybe they touch something that they shouldn't, maybe they're putting things in their mouth. Right? Like if I, like I don't like my kids chewing on things, chewing on their toys, right? If there's, if there's something that they should chew on, that's fine, but just chew, because I don't want them to just go other places and just chew on things. You know, they're at the church building, they just go over there, they chew on things. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't like, I don't like my kids, you know, chewing on things. So the way I teach them is if they chew on something, even if they're younger, I'll say like, don't put it in the mouth. Like I show them what they had in their mouth, don't put it in the mouth, and then you spank them. So you need to explain what you're spanking them for. So they understand. And that's why my children, they've never, they never have this impression that they're getting spanked just for no reason, because they understand always what they're getting spanked for, because I always tell them. So putting things in their mouth, you know, post-teething. And, and especially when they're, see, when they're older, when they're a kid, when they're really young, you can just tell them, don't do that, right? You tell them why they're getting spanking. But as they get older, what I would recommend is you start giving them reasons. So if Simon's putting something in his mouth, he gets spanked for putting something in his mouth. We're saying, hey, things are dirty. That's why we don't put things in our mouth. You, know, you put dirty, you know, when, they, when he's got ulcers in his mouth, it's like, hey, well, didn't we tell you not to put things in your mouth? You put things in your mouth and your mouth's all dirty. Things like that. So, you know, when, when you're raising your children, that's what I would recommend. Don't just give them instructions. Give them explanations as well. You know, don't think your children are just stupid. You know, even children that are Matea's age, Timothy's age, you know, when they start getting, you know, even, you know, Sarah's age, you know, Sarah can start to understand very simple concepts, you know, and we, we forget sometimes what it's like to be a child, you know, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, I remember being in like primary school and thinking I was really old and wondering why parents were talking down to me, you know, talk, you know say, I, like, I, 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 I remember being that old and, and understanding things and, and, you know, obviously you know more now. But my point is, I'm not saying that children are adults. I'm just saying that they, they can understand if you explain things to them. Don't, don't, uh, don't get into the mindset where children don't get what you're explaining them. And I've explained like com complex things to Simon and he catches a bit of it. So it's the same when you spank them. Explain to them. Don't just give them instructions, but give them some reasons as well. Because if, if you just give a child instructions, what I find is, if they're not sold on the reason for why they're doing it, 
then they'll just do it when you're not looking. But if you can convince them, hey, this is why you shouldn't be doing it, then when you're even not supervising them, they'll still not do it because they'll know why they shouldn't be doing it. And then you're just helping to correct them so that they'll continue to do that. that that's, that's, what, that's what my experience has been. Now, the last thing I want to touch on, and this is the, the last topic, the last one is have high standards for your children. Have high, stands, ha high standards for your children. So I already touched on it a bit when I talked about, hey, not getting, frustra not getting frustrated with your children and giving them just you know, a couple of warnings or one warning before spanking them. But if you want to see your children behaving in a way you know, that is a lot more mature, have high standards for them. A lot of people, they make too many excuses for their children. You know, they, they say, oh, children are just like this. Children just do this. Children just behave like this. Children just talk like this. It doesn't always have to be that way. You know, you can teach your child to behave a certain way and to speak a certain way and to act a certain way, to play a certain way, if you hold them to that standard, if you expect more from them. So let me give you an example. An example might be when I ask my children to come, if I, say, if, I, if I call one of my children and I say, Abel, come here, I expect them to come, right? It's not just, oh, you know, children, they like that, they get distracted and like, oh, I've got to go and run after them. This is just what children are like. No, 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 have some high standards for them. If I call Abel or I call Sarah and I say, hey, come here and they don't come, then I'm going to give them a spanking for that. Right? And then next time they come, they're going to come. So, I might, so let's, let me give you an example. Let's say I'm trying to train Abel to come to me. And Elizabeth's seen me do this before. You know, I'll say to Abel, hey, come here, Abel. And Abel's at the age where he'll kind of look at you. I don't know if you've seen Abel being naughty before. I'm sure you guys have seen But you know, he looks at you and he kind of drops his face and he's kind of like half like this. And he's like... <laughs> so Abel does <laughs> So Abel, if he doesn't want to do something, he'll kind of like... He'll just kind of look at you like this. Like... <laughs> that's, that's Abel's thing. So I'll be like, so I'll just pick him up. I'll go and pick him up, give him his face, and then I'll tell him, hey, when I, when I say come, you know, I bend him over the leg and I, I talk to him, I say, hey, when I say come, you come, right? And then I put him back over there, right? Where he was, he's standing there. And then I sit back in my computer desk and I say, Abel, come here. And then he's like, we'll come over this time. So, what I'm saying is you think your children are, are silly and they don't know what's going on. They know what's going on. And that's why you need, you need to realize children know what's going on. And that's why he, he knows that when I'm saying come, he, he didn't want to come. So there, there are plenty of examples like this, you know, asking them to sit and, and I'm not saying my children are perfect. You guys know my children. They're not perfect, right? But they, you know, even when, sometimes when my dad comes over, right, he's sometimes surprised because we, we always had our children sit with us and eat. Because that's something I always expected from them. You know, like if, if it's time to eat dinner, you come and you sit, you don't need to watch the iPad to get fed. You know, some children are like that. I don't know if you guys know parents that are like that. Every time they need to feed their children, they need to stick the iPad there, right? So the children's like, oh, they just get fed. But it's like when, when, when you come to my house, if, you, if you've eaten at my house before, you know, all, everyone sits together. Everyone sits and I, and I expect that from them. And that's why when, you know, Abel's now going through that stage where he has to learn to sit at the table, that's when spankings start happening, right? Because they have to get spanked you have to learn, hey, it's time to eat, you have to sit, to sit at the table. So it's just having that high standard. You know, another one is sleeping when it's time to sleep. You know, when I say to the, to the, to the older boys, hey, it's, you get ready for bed, you have to go to bed, and then I hear them mucking around in the bedroom, jumping on the bedroom, I come in, they're not doing it. So they get a spanking. Right? So they're not, like I said, they're not perfect, but they're getting better at it. You know, and now when I say, hey, get into bed, they're getting into bed. Right? So it's just things like that. You know, another one, sit quiet, sitting quietly in church. So Elizabeth as well, you know, she gets them to sit still when she's reading the Bible to them. It's the same sort of deal. You, they will do what you expect of them. So you can, you hold them to the standard and just teach them that. And you'll be surprised that they'll just start behaving like that because that's what you held them to. That's what you expected of them. You know, when you, when you ask them to clean up, they do it quickly. Another one is when I say stop playing, right? So they might be, Simon might be on the iPad. I say, Simon, time to stop the iPad immediately. Boom, it's close. If it's like, stop the iPad, he's like, keeps playing. 
I walk over to him, I take the iPad off him, I'm like, Simon, what did I say? He's like, stop the iPad. So he heard, right? He heard that I said stop the iPad. So what do I do? He gets a spanking for that, right? Because what do I expect from him? When I say stop the iPad, he heard it, he should stop immediately. It's the same, another example would be, I can go, go but I'm just saying, I'm just giving you some ideas of how you can up the standard with your children, right? So you're not running after them all the time. Another one would be when you're at the playground, right? And you call your children and you say, hey kids, time to go home, right? And then one kid might, might take a long time to go home. So you, you, you can give them a spanking for that. Whereas, see, I don't really have that problem because at my house already, I've tried to train my kids that when I ask them to do something, I expect them to do it. So when we go out, right, and they're all playing on the playground and I say, all right, kids, it's time to stop. Go put your shoes on. Immediately, they come from all quarters of the playground. <laughs> Get their shoes on, right? Because that's, that's what we expect from them. So it's just the same in any area of life, you know, getting ready for a shower. I'm even now trying to teach Abel to put the stool back after he pees. You know, there's that little green stool in our toilet. So he, he, cause you know, cause this is what I get frustrated at sometimes. Maybe I'm a bit pedantic about these things, but he'll pull the green stool out and then they'll pee and then they, then they just go out. And it's like, no, no, I expect more from my children. I say, hey, now you, have, you know you took the stool out, you gotta put it back, right? And we can, you can teach your children that. If you just expect that from them, then they'll do it. And you just have to be consistent. And the last one I've got here is just, you know, putting, like I said, putting things back where they belong. So hopefully you learn, I know it's, it's just like scattergun, just giving you all this information, but I hope every time I preach on this topic, you just get a little bit and it just helps you at home, uh, gives you a bit of practical insight to how we do things. Um, because I feel that really helps with parents is it really helps when you know somebody that has the same philosophy as you, similar standards than you, you know, similar principles, and you learn a bit about how things work in the home and that really helps get your head around things, especially as a, as a new parent or a parent of really young children. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Um, yeah, we just thank you, Lord, that you just give us um, guidance in this area. We don't always know, uh, you know, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't really know always what the best thing to do is. But Lord, you give us some very practical insight into how to rear our children, how to have the right attitude, what sort of instrument to use. So Lord, I just pray that you give us the faith to believe your word and to, to, to do it. Um, and help us not to be deceived by the world into their philosophies. Because Lord, if we do, we're going to have the results that they have. You know, we, we, we follow what they do. And Lord, we don't want to raise children like we see in the world. We want to raise godly children um, that will love you and serve you, that are respectable and have high standards. So thank you, Lord, for the children you've given us. Give us grace, Lord. We, we, we are not perfect. We're not perfect parents. We need grace. We need patience. We need to have you living through us so that we can do the right thing. So... Um, just help us, Lord, and just help us to raise a godly generation. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I hope uh, that was interesting for you. Let's just sing one last song before we uh, fellowship. So let's stand and sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And maybe I'll use this to conduct. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Here we go.